these people don't believe in it. Okay? But much of evangelical Christendom, how many of you have gone over here and looked at this little thing here? There are so many Christians today that are going to synagogues and learning about all the Jewish uh, rites and isms and feasts and all that kind of stuff. This here is evangelical churches all over the world getting together and donating money to Israel. They, they say, give us $1,500 a piece and we'll import one, uh, some Jew into the land of Israel. How many of you heard of that? Yeah. 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 All right. They're doing this. They're getting donations. And not only that, they're getting donations for the temple. They're going to build a temple. And what many people don't realize is this temple that they're going to build is the Antichrist temple. That's the temple for the Antichrist. Israel is going to accept the Antichrist. The whole situation today is they're going for the Antichrist. Now, how many of you have heard of Glenn Beck? A lot of people follow Glenn Beck, don't they? Now, let me just read you what they say about Glenn Beck. <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> and here we're talking about this guy, Bill, now. This, uh, this is uh, another guy. He's, uh, he speaks on uh, LDS and how to educate people and get them out of the Latter-day Saints church. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, Bill exposes the LDS Church's political ambitions and their strange theology about the U.S. Constitution. LDS and Muslim world are just like that. Did you know that? They got the same idea. They want to rule the world. What's the LDS? Yeah, Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. Okay. You will learn about their beliefs concerning the future of America and how they hope to rule over all of us in a religious dictatorship. You will also discover the astounding secret of the Washington, D.C. Temple. The vital message will help you to see why the mainstreaming of Glenn Beck and Mitt Romney is so disturbing and why close association between Christian leaders and Beck is a great concern to them. All right? Because he's advocating, I, he was just over in the Middle East, by the way, advocating all of us to go behind Israel and everything else. But Israel as it is today, I'm not saying that we shouldn't back Israel, but Israel is going against God. Israel will be spanked up straight one of these days. All right, God is going to warm them up there in the tribulation period. And I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't need America. He doesn't need Russia, he doesn't need China, or anybody else. None of those nations can destroy the nation of Israel. Do you, do you think they can? I don't. Why, Luther tried to, to exterminate. Augustine, Calvin called for the extermination of the nation of Israel. You can't do it. But as the people backing them and some of their political situations over there, I'm not all for that. Some ways they're right like that. But Israel has got to come up with this. Nobody can destroy the nation of Israel. God is going to take care of them. But he's going to keep them there just long enough. How many, if we have like a hundred million Jews, okay, how many million of those Jews are going to die? Huh? You said like two thirds. Two thirds of them. Two-thirds of them are going to die. One-third of them are going to be believers. And they will be brought into the millennial kingdom. Covenant theology does not believe in the millennium. They don't believe in Israel has any place in, in, in the future of God at all and his economy. Yes, Israel does. But God's going to have to change it. He's going to have to change it. Simple as that. Now, I hope I didn't confuse you too much with all this. Yes, Glenn Beck is a Mormon plant. Believe it or not, he is. If you'll, he'll salt and pepper his theology in everything that he does. And Mormonism, in the last days, all, it's going to be a one world religion, people. There's going to be Mormon, there's going to be so-called Christians in there, everything is going to be part of this one world religion that's going to be under the Antichrist. God's people better watch out. We're in the most dangerous time in, in church history, as far as I can tell you, right now. 
we're in the most dangerous time. We got cults rapid in the world. We got almost Christians rapid in the world. Uh, <clears throat> Mormonism, the Seventh day Adventists have done everything they can do to be recognized as Christians, but they are not. They are not Christians. All right? And Israel is God's people, but God's going to have to work them over a whole lot. And be sure, be very careful what you donate your money to <laughs> in these last days. All right, let's get in. I'm going to turn this thing on now where I can talk so I won't be at 86 off of the website. Marilyn, when you got that call the other day about them, yes, that was for you real. What are you talking about? About the website. Remember when the guy was speaking and, and he said he was a, they had a lot of complaints on the website about me being a, a fundamental dispensationalist. Linda, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, right? who, what? Who do you think will be the world uh, religion, Mormon or? All of us going to be together. Even well, I know that, but won't one religion lead it? Or? No. No? I think Catholicism, Mormonism, all of it, it will be all together according to that great conglomerate. Even, now, i got to put some of this on the camera, okay? <laughs> or So I can record the class. Yeah. Let me go ahead and record this. I don't think I'm going to say anything that's going to be terribly out of getting the 86. Uh, in the end times, the one world religion will be a conglomeration of all religions. Today we have radical Muslims. Muslims are no one's They're radical. But all Muslims aren't like that. Don't try to lump them all like that. They're all got one goal. But radical Muslimism, they will kill you. Alright? I mean that's that's what that's what they believe. But most of the Muslims don't believe that. In and in, right here in Bakersfield we just got Muslim mosques all over the place, no one. All over. We got Indian Muslims. The Indian Muslims, uh, they have the same. They don't believe in the right God, people. None of them have the right God. Their God is way out yonder, different from the Bible God. Okay? But uh, th those denominations are extremely different. In the last days, there is going to be a one world religion. They're going to still have church during the tribulation period. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> They're still going to have church address. <laughs> this is the uh, Antichrist destroyed that universal church pretty quick. At, in the thir at, after three and a half years of peace and wonder and a honeymoon, in the middle of it, yes, that's when he's going to turn on it. And he will destroy it. But that's three and a half years into it. When you really know who the Antichrist is, it's too late because we're supposed to be gone. <laughs> All right. Let's get into... Uh, the Gospel of Matthew now because we're getting into this. We're coming into the church age. The church is going to be called out in just a few minutes. Alright? God is going to start calling out His church. Matthew, the fourth chapter. The reason why I brought this what this, this, this little preface to the class today is the temptation of Jesus. The church is greatly tempted today with false religion and false ideas all over the place. You are... The churches in the world today are greatly, uh, there, is a, there is a bombardment of false information out there. What we have to do is just, uh, one of my teachers says, if they go way over here and they go way over there, some down pla someplace down the middle is the truth. So just remember that. Someplace down the middle. When we got hyper, when we got hyper Calvinism and we got Armenianism way over yonder on two corners, where is probably the truth? Someplace down there around sub left area. Okay. <laughs> All right. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Matthew, chapter four. Out of Matthew. All right. Now, Matthew looks at Jesus Christ as what? We always have to remember that. As the king of Israel. As the king of Israel. All right. Which one of the, which one of the flags represent him? The king. No, the north, south, east, west. Oh, you know, there was, a, there was four flags that flew. Remember, I gave you the little uh, flags out when you had the four flags. What? The eagle? Well, the eagle is God. That's, the, that's from heaven. Okay. Which one was the king of the beast? The lion. All right, Matthew. 
All right, Matthew. So this is the king of Israel. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the Diabolos. What's Diabolos mean? All right. Or one. And Jesus was led up unto the Aramu, unto the desert, unto the absolute destitute area where no life was. I mean, it's, it's dead and, and dry and, and it's wilderness. By the Spirit, all right, by the agency of the Spirit. Now, he was led up not by, not by Satan, but by Spirit God. Okay, I want you to understand that by Spirit God. What does it say in your translation? What's it say? Linda, are you there? Linda, are you there? Uh, no, I'm not. Oh, you're not. <laughs> oh, okay. What do you want? Four and one. Four and one. Four and one. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, now he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. <coughs> what Spirit? Spirit God. Okay. Spirit God was taking care of this. Now, he, he led him up there to be tempted. Parasthene. Okay. That's it. First Aris Infinitive Passive. It means to be tempted. Tempted. Tried. Put under pressure. Under. How many of you ever had a. Uh, Electromyelogram test. Anybody around here been through that torture system? <laughs> Anybody but me? EMG, electromyelogram. What, have you been through that, brother? That's wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful. This is when they take these long needles like this, real long needles, and stick them all the way down into the nerves in your legs, all the way from the bottom of your feet and every toe. Oh, I had that over my whole body from my neck down. That's just wonderful. That's torture, people. I had a doctor, one doctor that did that to me was horrible. He was enjoying every little bit of it. And I told him, I said, you know what, I've been to the sun dance. And that this is, you know, this is worse. <laughs> it, it's pretty rough. Tempted. All right, tempted. Put under pressure. By the day. Yes, brother. The same as the test, test. Test. It was a horrible test. Yeah, horrible uh, trials. Horrible trials. Okay? Now, Adam, the first Adam, now we're talking about the second Adam here now. Second Adam was who? The God from heaven. The first Adam was a God in the garden. I mean, not the God in the garden, but our Father in the garden. The second heaven, Adam, was a of the God from heaven that came down the earth. The first Adam in the garden had everything right there at his fingertips, all the pleasures of life and uh, all the food he needed. And it sure wasn't hot out there in the desert. And there was water to drink there in those streams that were running through the garden with all kinds of fruit that were on the trees all year long. And he didn't have to turn up a, a, a tap to take care of them because God had planted them. Everything was paradise. The word paradise there is just like paradise of heaven. It was a piece of heaven there where God put Adam. And Adam blew it. When the second Adam was tested, he tested under extreme conditions now. Not the same. And this is the God of heaven that came down. All right? The Diabolos. What does the Diabolos mean? Yeah. That the means the destroyer, the killer. And uh, <clears throat> having fasted how many days? Forty days, and uh, the word there in Greek is niktos, niktos, which we'll get our word night right out of that word, night. All right, forty days and forty nights. And afterward, it says that he was very hungry. Now, in Exodus 34 and 28, we find out that Moses fasted for forty days. Actually, he fasted about, about, about fifty days or forty-seven days altogether. But God took care of him. God took care of Moses. This one was up on Mount Zion. I remember receiving the law. And he had to go up there two different times. God took care of him all the time. All right. Now let's go to 4 and verse 3. And having approached the one tempting, the tempter, all right, the one tempting constantly, 
This is quoting the Septuagint in Deuteronomy 8 and 3, by the way, what he quotes. And he said to him, Since, this is not if now, this is since. This is a first class conditional particle, and it means a condition determined as fulfilled. This is since. Satan, the Avalos, admitted that Jesus was God the Son. Okay? He said, since, Son, you are of the God. You command. You command. He put that in the imperative mode. You command that the stones, these loaves uh, of bread, they may become. All right? Now, is it all right that I'm doing this? Is this confusing you too much? Read, reading this to you from Greek? All right? Because this, really, this is really a neat little area. I won't do this all the way through the book of Matthew, but we're doing it right here. Is that all right, Brother Abe? Am I doing all right? Yeah. yeah, all right. <laughs> all right, four and four. Four and verse four. Now, uh, <clears throat> Jesus is going to quote the Septuagint. But the one having answered, caught up in speech, he says, it has been written, not upon bread only, not upon bread only, shall you live for yourself. Is what it literally says. Shall you live for yourself. The man, but the man, upon every remata. Remember what that one means in you Greek students? That, that is every edict. That is a complete speech. It is a complete statement of God. Remata. But of every complete statement proceeding forth through the mouth of God. Every statement that came from the mouth of God. Now, we have a Bible, don't we? You know what, the, you know what Jesus just said heck, there? What he just said? That Bible came from the mouth of God. He used different people. There's about 40 different writers in the Bible. But the author of the book is God. He used those people, but really, in all reality, they were his mouthpieces. So they were spokesmen for, by God. It was just as valid as if God spoke it himself. When Moses says, what? Thou not, shall not use the Lord thy God's name in vain. What does that mean? That means God said it through him. That's the word of God. All right. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy. And look at this verse that Jesus is quoting. Deuteronomy 8 and 3. But it is the Septuagint. It's not the Hebrew Bible, all right? Go back to Deuteronomy 8 and 3, and let's look at it. <coughs> Deuteronomy 8 and 3. Whoever is that finds their way over there? Who's fast? Second law. Who gets the second law? Deuteronomy 8 and 3. Now, that's second law. That's what Deuteronomy almost means, second law. The second giving of the law. The explanation of the law. Are you over there, Brother Don? Yes. Okay. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna which neither you nor your fathers have known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. All right, every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. What God did in, to Israel in the, in the wilderness out there is he fed them manna. What is manna? The bread. Manna. It's manna. Okay, it's manna. It's like a seed. What? It's like a seed. Well, what is it? What does it mean, first of all, ma na? What is it? Ma, ma in Hebrew means what? What? Ma means what? Ma na means what is it? All right, that, they didn't know what it was. They called it ma na. What is it? What is it? <laughs> it looked like coriander seed. Now, uh, Mexican people, Hispanic people, use a lot of cilantro. Do they not? Cilantro comes from coriander seed. It's cilantro seed. Okay? That's what it looks like. That's what manna looked like, was that seed. How many of you do that? Right. Yeah. See? See? I don't know. <laughs> All right. We, we know what it looks like now, but, but they didn't know what it was. But what really was it? The Bible calls it the food of God, the food of angels. God gave them this perfect food that had all the vitamins in it that would keep them healthy. Oh, how many of you take vitamins? Anybody take vitamins around here? Vitamins, supplements, 
How about drugs? How many of you take prescriptions? Anybody take prescriptions? Mm -hmm. That manna had everything in it. You didn't need to go down to the, the, the friendly neighborhood drugstore. It had every prescription that they needed, kept them from having arthritis, everything else. That manna was a good food, okay? But he said they didn't live from manna alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. God fed them with his word, okay? Well, we learned a little bit about that now. Well, how about 4 and verse 5? Now the old devil, he takes alongside him, para lambane is what it says there, he takes alongside him the devil unto the holy city. Here we call the holy city. Now the Bible calls this the holy city. Why is Jerusalem such a holy city? Hmm? The holy city of God. It is God's city. All right, it's God's city. When you see those Jews over there where they can walk into the city of Jerusalem, Katie, bar the door. We're in the end time. I think we're real close to it right now. I, I've been saying this for 40 years, but and I've been hearing it for 40 years. But I'm going to tell you something, people. Things are looking real close. <laughs> They're looking real close. I'm not going to say that the Lord's going to come back at the end of this month like old Harold Camping, okay? But I think the time is short compared to the last 2,000 years. It's 2,000 years closer than it was 2,000 years ago, I can guarantee you. It's all leading up. All the players in the right place. Dr. John on 4 and 5, Matthew 4 and 5. He takes the devil on, uh, the devil takes him, it takes Jesus unto the holy city. Holy is Hagios. Hagios. What does Hagios really mean, you Greek scholar? Hagios. Hagios. Like that. Hagios. What does it mean? Come from Alpha and what? That's it. A. Alright. What does that mean? Not a word. That city has no natural resources at all, but the whole world is clamoring over Jerusalem even to this day. It's God's city. It's not, it's not the Muslim city. It's not the Jews' city. Whose is it? It's God's city. That's where he's going to deal with them one of these days. That's going to be the center of the whole world. That's going to be the center of the whole world one of these days. And the reason why it is because God said it's going to be. Not what we do or what we have to do. We don't have to defend Israel. God's going to defend Israel. Forget it. You couldn't destroy Israel if you took every atomic bomb in the world and tried to drop it on them. God stopped the bombs. <clears throat> Not going to happen. And he stood him upon the... Uh, you see over here? He went right out here. See up here on this wall? That's where he took him, right there on that wall. It said the wing of the temple. That valley down there is deep. And he stood him on top of that wall. <clears throat> and he stood him upon the wing of the temple. And he says to him, Since, son, you are of the God, you cast yourself down. Kato, cast yourself down. For, you know, the devil likes to quote scripture. Have you noticed that? Uh, every false religion out there will quote some scripture. They will. They'll use the Bible to damn themselves. The, <clears throat> the Word of God said that, that they will twist, they will rest the scriptures to their own washing. Damnation. Well, Satan's quoting the Bible. It has been written, or it has been written that the ones, angels of him, that his angels, He shall command concerning you. He's talking about God. He said he shall command concerning you. And upon the hands they shall bear you. May quote they lest you may strike one of your feet against a stone. Psalm 91 verse 11. Look at Psalm 91 verse 11. The old devil's quote the scripture. Psalm 91 verse 11. Psalm 91 and verse 11. 
Now what he's trying to do here is he's trying to get Jesus to obey him. He tried to get him to make bread, stones into bread. Now Jesus could have done that, couldn't he? Why, he could have turned stones into, stones into people. One time when he was over there in Jerusalem, he said, if I, if, if I stop these people from hailing my a triumphant entry into, into Jerusalem, what would cry out? The stones would cry out. Okay? Who's over there in Psalm 91? Verse 11. I am. All right, go ahead. For he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of his ways. <coughs> all right. In all your ways. I'm yeah, sorry. in all your ways. And what else? Twelve. Uh, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. All right. So when Jesus was on this earth, he did have some spiritual protection, didn't he, as a physical person. When God became flesh, yes, the angels did minister to the Son to protect Him. This is God the Son in the flesh. This isn't just some angel. This is, this is, the angels are protecting God the Son. So He did have protection. How many of you realize that? He had guardian angels when He was here. The Bible teaches us that. Have you ever even thought about that in your life? Are you studying that? Four and verse seven now. He had guardian angels. Old Satan. Now, now Jesus talks. Oasis. And the Jesus, he said to him, Again, it has been written, Not you shall, not you shall overtempt. Not you shall uh, insult the Lord, the God of you. Jehovah Elohim. You know what he just said here in this verse? He said, I am Jehovah Elohim. Do not overtempt me. <laughs> Don't step out too far, old boy. Because I am the Lord your God. I have divested myself of much of my glory and much of my powers and I am standing here walking in the flesh of Adam but do not overtempt me don't step outside of your boundaries because I'm still God I am still Jehovah Elohim even though I'm in the flesh I'm still Jehovah Elohim Exodus 17 and verse 7 and Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16 4 and 8 <coughs> Now the devil, whole diabolo, again, he, uh, lead, he goes along and he leads him unto a oros. Oros is the Greek word for mountain, and hor is the Hebrew word for mountain. A mountain high, real high, exceedingly. Who's the one like that goes up into the clouds. Could it be government too, really? What? Could it be government? I think this is a, a great tall mountain, which could be government, but he's up high. I want you to understand one thing about angels. God <coughs> took and created Adam and put him in a garden. And he created that garden that was an absolute paradise. And he failed. And we know that one, <coughs> one angel that is over the nation of Israel is what? What's the nation? What's the, what's the, I mean, what angel is over the nation of Israel? Who is the protecting angel of Israel? We have seen that in the Bible, in the book of Daniel. And Michael, Michael. Michael. He's the protector over Israel, all right? Now, he is stronger than 10,000 tanks from Red China or every Arab in the world, period. Okay? Only what he lets go through, he lets go through. Now, there are angels over every nation. Well, we're, we're talking about pneumatology now. Okay? Spiritual things. Pneumatology and angelology. 
There are angels over every nation. Angels are appointed over every nation. Now, as you go up in here in this high mountain, this could be uh, up in the up in the in the heavens. Even it was either a mountain very very high, where you could look down on the earth, or he took him up into the where all the head angels over all these nations down there were, because there are angels over every nation. The Bible talks about them. Uh, the angel over Egypt, the angel over Babylon, the prince, they call them the princes overall. In the book of Daniel, we've seen the book of Ezekiel, the book of Revelation. That's why it's the book of Revelation, not Revelations. The Re book of Revelation, all right? takes him up into a high mountain exceedingly beyond, exceedingly, and he points out to him all of the kingdoms of the world, the cosmos, of the whole world, the cosmos. This is talking about all the heavens. All the heavens. Now, and uh, the glory of them. All of their powers and glory and power of things going. This is either a very high mountain or possibly up in the heavens and he sees all of the angelic forces over every nation on earth. Now by the way, who is the God of this age? The devil. So is this really? Now who are all these na all of these angels down here? Who's protecting all these different nations? Satan's angels. You go back, and the book of Revelation talks about Satan uh, rebelling against God. If you go Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, and you find out what when Satan rebelled against God, and he took, according to the book of Revelation, how many, what percent of the angels and spiritual forces with him? One third. One third. All right. One third of them. That's a lot. Because there's a lot of angels. There's enough of those angels to completely be caretakers of every ungodly nation in the world, including America. All right? Period. There's all of them out here. We're, he is the God of this age. So now this is where Jesus is. He's up looking over all of this. Okay? And he says to him, the things. The things, these, I shall give if, look at this now, this word here, if, is a third class conditional part. Condition undetermined but with definite prospect of determination or fulfillment as far as Satan was concerned. But really, it was no chance. <laughs> fulfillment. He said, if you having fallen down and bend the knee toward me, if you do this, all right. If you, having fallen down and been in the middle of this, then he says to him, to Jesus, Be gone. Be gone. This is the God of the universe commanding you. This is not an angelic force. This is not Michael. This is not an angelic force. This is Jehovah Elohim. He tells Satan, Be gone. Go. When Michael rebuked Satan over the body of Moses according to the New Testament scriptures, what did he say? What did he say? The Lord rebuked you. The Lord rebuked you. Right here we see Jehovah rebuking Satan. Jehovah is rebuking Satan. Get out of here. Be gone. Second person singular present in parity vacuum. You go, Satan, Satana. He doesn't call him here Diabolos, but Satana. What is the one? What does Satana mean or Satan? One who stands against. He always opposes God, doesn't he? And he's opposing God directly right here. But he's opposing God in his human form. God bowed down, condescended to redeem his universe and he became flesh and in some ways he became 
fragile. So he could redeem us. How fragile was he? What happened to him just before the cross? What happened to Jesus before the cross? He was arrested, wasn't he? Do you think that he allowed himself to be arrested? Yes. Did he allow himself to be whipped? Did he allow himself to be tried? Remember what he told Pontius Pilate? Pontius Pilate was all shook up. He declared Jesus innocent five times. And he, he, he was all behind himself and he says, Well, don't you know that I can turn you loose? He said, You have no power except what you are given. And who was giving him the power? Jesus was giving him the power. He was allowing him to try him. Everywhere in the world he tried to turn him loose. And then he was crucified. Jesus allowed himself to be crucified. You know, we've got all kinds of special effects movies now. You know how they stick bullets in people and the, and the bullets just shoot out of them, you know, and there's some supernatural being and all that kind of... Why? Jesus, when he's laying down on the cross, he could have shot every one of them nails that was nailing him to the cross and stood up as God Almighty. But he didn't chose to do that. He condescended to come down here to redeem us because we needed redeemed. Get out of here, Satan. It has already been written... The Lord, the God of you, you shall worship, and to Him only you shall serve. Satan, I'm not going to bow down and worship you. You bow down and worship me. I am the God of heaven. You should worship the Lord your God only. I'm the one. You worship me. I don't worship you. All right, foreign... And then it says, you should worship in Deuteronomy 6.13 and Matthew 6.24. Alright. 4 and 11. Then he leaves him, the devil. And behold, angels, they have approached and they kept on ministering to him. See, here are his guardian angels. Alright. These are his guardian angels. Now let's go on. And I'm going to drop... I, I just had to read that to you from Greek, okay? <laughs> it's a little bit more explanatory. For and verse number 12. Now when he had heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. What does Galilee mean? Circle. Circle. Thank you. Galilee means circle. Thank you, Brian. What circle? Around the Sea of Galilee or uh, Gennesaret. All right, this is a, this is a, a, it's a big lake is what it is. And there was many cities around there. And that's where, and this was also the what? The trade route of the whole Middle East world. So everything that was happening right there made news all over. This was like, this was like New York City at that time. Right through here, this is where everything's going. All the trade routes went through there. So everything that happens there, the world hears about it next week. Okay, it's carried about. These travelers are going from one end of the, of the country to the other. And then it says, and leaving, literally it says, and having left Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum. Capernaum. What does Capernaum mean? It comes from two Hebrew words. Kafar means what? Kafar. Anybody know what Kafar means? What? Covering. Thank you, young lady. I knew we had one Hebrew scholar in here. Kafar means covering. And then Nahom. Nahom. We have Nahom in the Old Testament. Book of Nahom, don't we? All right, Kafar and Nahom. This is the home of Nahom, many people say. Nahom also means beloved. Beloved home. Beloved covering. Beloved home. All right. So he settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was the fulfill that was spoken through the Isaiah the prophet. All right, Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 9 and 1. Isaiah the prophet said, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who are sitting in darkness saw a great light, the people are, who are setting in darkness. Israel was now setting in spiritual darkness. Their religion had become a, a religion of darkness. 
God had a lot of trouble with Israel. God has always, He's still having trouble with Israel. <laughs> if He wasn't having trouble with Israel today, we'd be in the millennium. If, if Israel would have accepted the Messiah, we would have been in the millennium. But they did not. God did not postpone His kingdom because His, his kingdom was carried on through His churches in this age that we live in today. God reigns in His churches. He should. He reigns in His churches. Either He reigns in the church or the church is long gone or His, one or the other. Except as that. Don't forget that. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. Who was that great light? What does the Bible say? God is what? Right. God is light. Who was who was there? God, that is light, came to his people. All right. God is light. They saw a great light. And to those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death, upon them a light dawn. The shadow of death. Religion. Religion. Look at the word religion. That's an unusual word, all right? It comes from three, a prefix and a suffix and a root, all right? Simple word. Re means what? Again. Back again. All right. How many of you have ligaments? Anybody ever have a torn ligament in here in this room? Torn? torn. I got some torn to me all over the place. Huh? You know what a ligament is? Yeah, all right. Ligament is what? What does a ligament do? It attaches muscle to bone. Huh? Yeah, bone, bone, muscle to bone. All right. All right. What, what ligaments attach? Muscles do what? They constrict and they move. And they're attached and they move bones. And ligaments, we get our word ligament from leg array. Leg array. All right, which means to bind. All right, and then I O N means what? What's the end of that word? The act of. So in this word religion, we have the act of binding back again. But you know what? Their religion had bound them away from God, not back to God. <laughs> False religion can bind you away from God, not back to God. And that's what had happened. Their religion had bound them away from God. Now this is what he says. <coughs> and from that time Jesus <coughs> kept on preaching and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is right here. It's here. It's at hand. Now if I walk over here, and, and this is the closest person to me, they think you are. That's how close the kingdom of God was. Just like that. Hand to hand. Thank you, brother. Hand to hand. Hand to hand. The kingdom of God was right there. Here's the king of God. This is the king. This is God the Son right there. He's there. Right at hand. You don't have to look for him. He's there. Okay? You don't have to go down and look around the corner. You don't have to go to New York City or L.A. to see him. He's there. And you know what? Jesus is still here today. He's here in his churches today. The kingdom of God is at hand. And verse number 18, now he begins to call out his church. What does church mean in Greek? How do you say church in Spanish? Iglesia? All right, Iglesia. That comes from Greek, by the way. All right. It's an Iglesia. It's an Ecclesia. Something like that. It comes from Ek and Collium. It's like that. Collium. Ek and Collium. Call One's called out. One's called out. Now let's go see the church being called out. Simple as that. Here's the church. This is the beginning of the church right here. All right. Verse number uh, <coughs> 20. No, 18. And walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. What does the word for brothers mean? Adelphos. What does brothers mean? 
a devil from the same womb. That's what brothers mean, from the same womb. <laughs> when we call each other brother and sister in church, it means that we've been, we were birthed by the same God. Birthed by the same, or from the same womb. Okay? He saw brother Simon, who is called Peter. What Simon mean? One who hears. One who hears. Thank you, brother. You've been catching on. And Peter, what does that mean? Little stone. Little stone. All right, little rock. Little stone. And Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew. What does Andrew mean? Huh? Mankind. All right, they're mankind. All right. Cast these net into the sea, and they were what? Fishermen. This was a this was a an occupation. This is what they did. They were fishermen. I like to fish. You like to fish? I like to fish. And uh, he said to them, "Follow me, and I'll make you what? I'll make you fish better fishermen. <laughs> I'll make you fishers of men." <coughs> now there's a song out, "Fishers of Men," isn't it? A little kids sang it. And and the uh, vacation Bible school and stuff, come on, something, I'll make you figure the man. Well, I, I don't remember songs very well at all. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going through there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So we have James and we have John. Now, how many church members do we have so far? This is four. Now, I want to ask you something about these people here. Now, who prepared them to become church members? Who prepared them? Ioan a baptizo. John the Baptist. John the Baptist prepared them. They'd already been baptized. They'd already repented. These people are already saved. They've already been. Re they've already repented. They've already been baptized. They've repented their sins and they've been baptized already. All right. <clears throat> John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And what happened to them? Immediately they left the boat and their father. They followed. They have walked off and left their occupation now. Sometimes God calls you to do some wondrous changes in life, doesn't it? 23, verse number 23 now. And Jesus, having gone about in all of Galilee, what does that Galilee mean again? The whole circuit. Teaching in what? Synagogue. Synagogue. All right, he's teaching in the Jewish synagogue. And proclaiming the what? The good news, the gospel. Of what? Of the kingdom. And healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Well, I'm going to tell you, if I read you all the cross-references to verse number 23, it would be, take me five minutes. There's a point in Jesus kept on going about all of Galilee, all the circle, teaching. Teaching. He's indoctrinating these people. With what? Interpreting the Bible to them. Every, in every synagogue, they would get up there and they had a copy of the books of Moses. And they would get someone some volunteer that was a part of that synagogue, and he would get up and he would stand and read the scriptures, and then he would sit down and he would proclaim the meaning of those scriptures. So what Jesus would do, he would go from synagogue to synagogue. He was no stranger in these synagogues. He was a master teacher. He was a rabbi, wasn't he? What they called a rabbi. What does rabbi mean? Teacher. What? Master teacher, a doctor of theology. That's who he was. He was a doctor. Or a doctor, a master teacher. He was a master, master teacher in all of these synagogues. And he just kept on going around. And he kept on teaching, indoctrinating them, and, and explaining the scriptures to them, telling them who he was. And what else does it say he did? Preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, 
and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Now this is unusual now. Who was going to be the one that would heal all the sicknesses? Who was going to be the one? Jesus. Why did Jesus heal anybody, by the way? Why did he heal anybody? To show him that he was the Messiah. It wasn't because he, he, he didn't come out there just to have mercy on people, to see people that were sick, and to make them feel good. Make them live longer lives, healthier. That wasn't the purpose of what he was doing. There were blind people. Only the Messiah could heal a blind person. Did you know that? Only the Messiah would heal a blind person. No one in the Old Testament has ever healed a blind person. So that's purely a messianic credential. When you have a credential, do you have a driver's license with your picture on it? Yeah, that's a credential. Jesus' messianic credentials were he was the Messiah. To prove that he was the Messiah, he was going to heal people. And what he did was he preached the good news of the kingdom of God. The king has come. I am here. I am God the Son. Jehovah. What does Jehovah mean? Who shall, shall become. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning, kept on being the Jehovah. And Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead because Jehovah kept on being God. And then in John 1.14 says, Kaiholongo Sarks again. What? And the uh, Jehovah and the Word, the flesh, He became. And He dwelt among us and we saw the glory of God. And it told about how that he had uh, created everything. And he came to his creation, but his, the creatures accepted him not. The creation accepted him, but the creatures, the creatures, the humans accepted him not. Yes. Yeah. Kingdom is a nation, right? A uh, kingdom is a nation, yeah. So, heaven is heaven, right? Heaven is. That is a kingdom. Of heaven is... Nation, God's nation. That's right. Different. Heaven is heaven, right? Yes. Hashemayim, Uran noise. The heavens, the heaven itself, paradise of God, is God's kingdom. It's going to expand one of these days and in past the whole universe. Right now, we've got to fool around with Satan for a while. We've got to put up with the rational. How many of you had to put up with a with a master on a job for several years before you could retire? Anybody you ever had to do that? Yeah. Had to put up with him for a while. We have to put up with this scoundrel that is called Satan for a while. But you know what? One of these days we're going to be uh, we're going to be heirs of the kingdom. Isn't that nice? Right? Heirs of the kingdom. And the news about him went out all of Syria. Remember what I told you. This is the this is the crossroads of the world, of the ancient world. And the news about him went out all of Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, and taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs. Now look at that word demoniac there. What does that mean? People that were possessed of fallen <coughs> spirits. Angels what? Angels have form. Spirits do what? Fallen spirits, demon spirits do what? They seek to dwell in animal or human flesh. For some reason they want to dwell in some form of moving animated being. Whether it's an animal or human flesh. Human. Some people were possessed with demons. Epileptics, it says here. Paralytics. And he healed them. And it said great multitudes, a great crowd followed him. <clears throat> great crowd followed him great crowd followed him Oh, 
Oklos. Oklos in Greek means five, five to ten thousand people. Where do you see that Oklos? Huh? Where's that at? The crowd. It says that at great multitudes. Oh, okay. All right, great multitudes. That's oh close, but it's not oh close. It's oh close. Oh close. Oh close. Oh close is nominative singular, masculine. This crowd is here. It says there that in in the different places in the Bible, it says five thousand followed him, and it says ten and twelve thousand followed him. All right, <coughs> five thousand men. This is talking about men. There was at least 5,000 men where it talked about Oklos, but we're not talking about Oklos, we're talking about Oklos. Here is probably 12 to 20,000 men. Men. And when you got one man, how many other people you got? You got his wife and, and chillings. <laughs> and the kids. So, so how many people were here? Probably 25 or 30,000 people. Now just think about, you know, here at Valley Baptist Church, there's about 10,000 people that come to church here to go to Sunday school and everything. That's quite a few people. It's like, that's bigger than any city I ever lived in. Did you know that? I live out there yonder by Mettler, you know, between Pumpkin Center and Mettler, out there in the middle of nothing. The Old River has a population of 140. That's where I live. I lived up there in Fish Lake Valley in what was called Dyer, Nevada, and the population up there was about 300. I lived out there in Valley Acres, and the population there was 340. And I come over here to Valley Baptist Church, there's 10,000 population. But that's not as big as the crowd that's following Jesus. Here we've got probably 25 or 30,000 people following Jesus. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. Well, that's where we're going to end up right now. We'll come back there next week. And uh, he's got about... 20 to 30,000 people following him now. That's a, quite a group of followers, isn't it? So, and then as they go out, how many people do you think they're telling? Think about that. He used to be old sword. Tell Pete, he'll tell everybody. <laughs> That's what was going on here. Here we are at the crossroads of the Middle East. And he's got about 25,000 people following him all over. And they're carrying on all of the things that he's done. Now, do you think that these Jews, these Pharisees and scribes, do you, what do you think of their thinking about this situation? Since they're, they're, they're in the spiritual darkness. All right. Well, thank you for your attention. Brother Brett, it's your turn. Thank you for enduring those hard things. I hope you enjoyed God's Word today. Come back at 4.30 this afternoon and I'll teach you a little Hebrew. Well, I saw the crew at school.